So um, I want to talk about tensors. So this is this is going to finish up what we've been talking about in the class is this uh, this concept of a tensor. And really, at the end of the day, one of the interesting things is it's going to get right to the heart of one of the major assumptions we've been making uh, is that if you look at everything we've been doing, we've been working a lot on matrices. Obviously, it's a linear algebra course, so you you'd expect that, right? Um, but what we want to do is talk about, is there a generalization of this concept of a matrix? And in fact, there is. And that's exactly where this idea of a tensor comes from. So we want to talk about this. And I'm going to get a new pin because I that one's not so good. And we want to talk about this generalization and talk about how do we do, what do we do with data? In fact, mostly what we've been doing with data is we've gotten around this tensor idea. We'll talk about a tensor in a minute, which is a generalization of a matrix by doing something what we say vectorizing our data, right? So what we've done is we've taken data and we've made it fit into matrices okay, by vectorizing that data. And that's an important thing uh, that I want to highlight here is that this is something that we just do routinely and we don't talk too much about it. So for instance, you know, we could take a data matrix. Sorry, we have, in fact, one piece of data could in fact be a matrix. So for instance, I could go grab the temperature distribution in some region of latitude and longitude. So my data itself is a matrix. But what I want to do is take this data over different sets of time. And so I want to consider this to be one piece of data. So let's call this X of J. And normally what we do, if we want to start looking at these decompositions like the SVD or QR or any of the things that we've learned, if you go back to the very first lecture of this class, I talked about everything was going to be framed around doing a decomposition of a matrix essentially. And then we use these decompositions to our advantage, okay? And so if we take this as one piece of data, so for instance, in our Yale faces, what do we do? If maybe this is a picture of a face. Then what we did to do an SVD and look for principal component analysis, we took this data and we vectorized it. So in other words, we took it and we reshaped this into a vector. That's the X of J. So you could do this by stacking the columns on top of each other. Okay, so this is this reshaping we do with the data. And so the X of J now is my data rearranged to be in vector form. Okay, and that's one piece of data. But this is just, you know, you could have data that's multi-dimensional, not just two-dimensional. Oftentimes, you know, we, when, we're, when we're looking at matrix decompositions, we think I have a row of data, but really here, you know, it's clearly two-dimensional. So I have two directions that I flatten. Imagine what you would do if you had three dimensions. Okay, some cube of data. Okay, and what would I do with this? Same thing, vectorize this. In other words, take this thing and reshape this into a big vector. So now what I would do is I would take this much like we did here where we stack columns on top of each other. I would do that, but now I have three directions. I'm X, Y, and Z. So I have, right? So I, and, and by the way, MATLAB and Python doesn't care with if you have two dimensional, three dimensional, n dimensional arrays, it really doesn't. In other words, you can make cu cubes of data, uh, fourth dimensional cubes of data, five dimensional cubes of data. Okay, so it doesn't matter. The point is, when I collect the data, what we've been doing so far to make it fit 
into our linear algebra form as we take this data and we do a reshape command, for instance, in MATLAB to make it into a vector. And then what I do is this is my data x of j, but now it's vectorized to this x of j. And then what we do is take these reshaped versions of it and that's how we define our matrix A, right? We just put our data here. And oftentimes what we do in data analytics is now what we'll do is we'll do a decomposition. For instance, we'll do the SVD of this. This is what you've did in some of the homework, right? In fact, you did it in uh, the homework on SVD. You took each one of these was a face, a Yale face, for instance. And you'd say, here's all these faces. What's the correlation between them? And you would do something like an SVD of this. And now, by now, you should be pro level with this, which is you've already done something like this. So you know how it works. And you, here's what your features are. Here's your dominant eigenfaces. Here, this vector V is how, how each individual face projects onto those dominant modes. Okay, so this vectorized form of the data actually is very, uh, it's very nice. It works very well. We've learned how to use it. Okay. But you can see this vectorization process, especially if you have multi dimensional data, gets to be very big. So, for instance, if I have a cube here, which is 100 points in this direction, 100 points in different directions, 100 points in that direction, the total amount of data is 100 cubed. So, it's, when I vectorize it, this thing is massive. Okay, so this is one of the interesting issues about this vectorization of data. And you should understand we vectorize data all the time. And in fact, we rarely work with tensor decompositions. We instead always do this step first. Vectorize, put it into a matrix, and then do your linear algebra with the vectorized data. Okay, that's our process. Now, the question is, what's the problem with that? Or is there a problem with that? Well, so let's try to address this a little bit. And I wanna, I wanna start telling you why maybe, maybe we could start thinking about instead of vectorizing, maybe there's a way to generalize this concept of an SVD by not vectorizing. And in fact, that's exactly what I wanna show you talk about today. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna do some of this actually implementation of code in class on Friday, okay? So it's a good thing for you to know how to do. Okay, but why would we wanna do it in the first place? Why not just commit to vectorization and why, because everybody else does it, right? And if everybody else does it, why, why, would, why would we do anything different? Well, let me tell you, show you why we might want to do something a little different. And I'm going to come to, to this here, which is, uh, let's talk about a picture. Um, I'm going to try to uh, sketch this. This is going to be not the best, but fine. Just play along with me. Uh, OK, so let's take some feature of this data. So for instance, uh, let me color code this cube Maybe I have a structure here. Uh, uh, so let me make a simple data matrix like this. So it's, it's all zeros and ones in these spots. Okay. And suppose, in fact, that's what a face looked like. Okay. In other words, you have eyes, nose, and a mouth. Now, what happens under the process of vectorization? What would happen to this thing that's broken up? Uh, in fact, let's just do, do it five by five. Sorry. Okay, when you do this, what happens under vectorization? Well, now, if this is five by five, this is a vector of length 25. And suppose I get this by stacking. Take this, put it here first. Nothing, right? Take this, put it here next. So one, two, three, four, five. And notice that the second block here is this guy here. And then you put the next pieces in, which is there, 
This block is in here, there. Next two blocks are black, black, there. Now what's interesting about this is notice these two points are next to each other. They really are next to each other in the way you collected the data. But what just happened when I vectorized it? When I vectorize it, this point's up here. This point is in points later. So sorry, M. If this is an M by M matrix, I don't see this point, which is right next to it in the two-dimensional space. It sees it M points later. They're not close anymore. So this process of vectorization would take some neighboring points and make them m a distance m apart. Same thing happens here. Now, if I stack this next one, these guys now live down here. So it's there's the two points. And notice again, these are supposed to be right next to each other, and now they are m apart. Okay, so this is what happens under vectorization. And so the question is, when you do PCA, what are you doing? When you do PCA, if you notice how we did this, is you take all this data, you stack, you, you vectorize it. The SVD gives you the dominant correlated structure. This is how we got the eigenphase pictures, right? We go look at this thing, and then when you reshape it back into a face, it kind of looks like a face. And so it does a still pretty good job, even though you started splitting the data like this, it actually still did a pretty good job of keeping things that are kind of close spatially. The question is, could I have done better by not doing this vectorization process? And the reason I did the vectorization is because I have codes that go all the way back to the 60s, right? with SVD, QR, all these codes that have been developed for matrices that are very fast, that people have developed over decades. And those are easily accessible to you. So you can just say, take the data, vectorize it, use those algorithms. Or you potentially could say, maybe I should just stay and use different data here and don't vectorize it. And then use this data here, which would mean if I Instead of stacking this to get a matrix A, if I stack the data, I would get a data cube. So each one of these is a slice here. Or said in the way of if you're if these were faces, each one of these slices is a face. Okay. And so I say I want to really look at the correlation, but that's no longer a matrix. This is a data cube. Okay. By the way. In MATLAB, if you want to make a three-dimensional cube of data, for instance, it's as easy as saying RAND, N, 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 for instance. This will make you a data cube with random numbers. By the way, I've obviously made a data cube, so it's there's a three directions. But I could put a fourth, a fifth, a sixth. MATLAB doesn't care. Neither does Python, right? You just say make this into some hypercube that has as many different directions as I want. So when you do data analytics, that's actually important because oftentimes data is in fact multimodal and it has different directions, right? I measured these kind of quantities and it's eight dimensional data. Well, you can make each eight dimensional data versus I take the data and I flatten it like this. And after I do the, my analysis, I, I reshape it back into the original frame. Here, you just say, just, I'll, I'll just try to work directly with, can I do a decomposition of this directly? And that's the idea of tensors, okay? So there's this idea that somehow when you do this, you, come, you somehow lose some information about, these are no longer neighbors. You still get good correlation, but the question is, if I work directly here, could I do better? Okay. All right. So what I really want to do, and we're going to stick to the case of data matrices that are matrices itself or data cubes. And let's, I'm going to illustrate the points of how this actually might work for us to do decompositions. All right.
So remember, this is always what we're assuming. It's kind of one of these things, you know how it's, it's just this implicit assumption that everybody kind of makes and we don't talk about it. We just say, oh, you know, of course you do that. We don't talk about what, what are the consequences of that assumption. And so now I'm really trying to bring that back up here. So let's go back and talk about what did we do with matrices and decompositions. And specifically, I want to focus in on the SVD. Because the SVD is sort of like your, I think, most important decomposition that you could work with. So what did we do? What we did is we took some matrix A, right? And the idea behind the SVD is to say, I have a matrix A, which is M by N. And my job is to take this matrix and look to see if there's features or a low rank subspace for me to represent the totality of that matrix A in a very clean, elegant, low rank way. Okay, a low, so I want to do some kind of low dimensional projection on this thing. Of course, you don't have to do low rank projections, but ultimately, that's kind of why you would do an SVD is you'd say like, I have all this data, can I find some low rank embedding of this, where all my data sits, okay? So what did you do? Well, we said we could decompose this into a matrix U. Sigma and then V. Okay. And that's the transpose R V star. Okay. So this is M by R. This thing would be R by R, and this would be R by N. So this was the idea. Diagonal matrix U's and V's. And what I've already ex explicitly drawn here is that, oh, there's some low rank subspace of rank R, where this here can approximate the matrix A, okay? This is what the SVD does. I have a set of columns. This is my, spans my column space. The V tells me how every single, every single column of, of A actually projects onto U, which is sort of my dominant correlated features of the data, okay? Another way to write this too is to say, well, if I'm going to project into R dimensional subspace, then this here, what, uh, what I'm guaranteed is the matrix A is the, minimizes, or sorry, this matrix U minimizes this quantity here, which is you take the matrix A, you project into an R dimensional subspace. Now you project back into the higher space. And this is guaranteed to be, in fact, the best least, uh, the best in the least square sense projection of the data in a low rank, in some low rank way. And in fact, you can bound this to be, you know, whatever the top biggest singular value is. So wherever you truncate at R, this thing is bounded by like R plus one, the largest, the, the next singular value. Okay, so you have some nice theoretical guarantees around this. And this is what we did with SVD the whole time. So this is what you want to do is you want to take matrix decompositions and now with, with big matrices A, and ultimately, like I said, part of the whole goal of this class in scientific computing is to say, I'm ultimately going to eventually work with really big matrices. If you don't work with a big matrix, just hit backslash, you're done. Like, it's that easy if you're going to solve AXE. There's no, re no need to decompose it because it's super fast. All these techniques we're talking about are matrices where this starts to get very big. But by the way, the, the definition of very big keeps changing, right? So when I started teaching at the UW some, some just a couple of years ago, <laughs> actually it was a while ago now, uh, you know, I had, a, I had a laptop and I could... I could, uh, I could start, start running codes like on my laptop in class where I could do it in real time. And some of the, some of the codes I was running were to generate some matrix A, which are differentiation matrices. 
I could only run in real time matrices of size like 16 by 16. Otherwise, we just sit there forever and look at each other in class and be uncomfortable. But now, I, I, you know, I can do matrices of size, you know, 1024 by 1024 for the same problem. This is just in my time teaching here, right? And I'm not even that old. So you know, this is, so what it means to be big here keeps changing. Back in 1995, what big meant is very different from what it means in 2020. Okay, big now is like Google big, Facebook big, like matrices that are like millions, millions by millions or billions by billions, trillions by trillions, right? Not 10,000 by 10,000. You can actually, that's not that hard. But in 1995, that was pretty hard. Now you can just do it on your laptop. Okay, and how do you do it? Well, you, you know, these are the kind of tricks that you use to get information out of these matrices, okay? So another way to represent this, by the way, is that you remember that when I do a reconstruction with the SVD, that what I really have is I can reconstruct this matrix A as a rank R approximation, which would be the U of J, sigma J, V of J, right? I just add these together, linear, combinations of these columns times sigma one v, this v1 sigma two v2 that's it okay i'm going to draw what this looks like in a picture view and in particular i'm going to bring these two together so in other words you're going to just go ahead and take the co coefficient well actually i'm not going to do that sorry i lied let's just leave it like this and i'm going to show you a picture of what this looks like when we do this kind of decomposition. So this here can be represented instead by the following. In this low rank approximation way, I have the vector u1. And then here, I have v1 sigma1. plus sigma two, u2, v2, plus sigma three, u3, v3, plus all the way to rank R. This is what we're doing. We're basically saying this matrix A is an outer product u1, v1, with the weighting sigma one added to sigma two times u2 v2, which is an outer product. And what I do to construct this matrix approximation is I add these together. It's a linear combination of these subspace embeddings. Everybody go with that, hopefully. So that's what we did with SVD. So the question is, how does this generalize when I move away from the data being in a matrix to the data being in, in some higher dimensional form, okay? So that's what we want to talk about. And you'll see that it's going to work out pretty well for us here. My couple comments, these U's here are spanning for us the column space of this matrix A. That's what the U1, U2, U3 are. It's like, here's some directions that span the column space. This is exactly what we talked about in the randomized linear algebra algorithms, as well as what a Q matrix does and a QR factorization is, how can I construct a set of orthonormal directions that span the column space? That's what these U1, U2, U3, and U all the way to U of R are doing. And the V are taken care of instead of the column space, the row space. Okay. So those are the con concepts that we have span the row space, column space of the matrix A. This is how it's done by basically outer products of these vectors. One which is in the row direction, one which is in the column direction. And what I'm trying to get at here is that's exactly what we're gonna do next with tensor decompositions. Find vectors that span, you don't just have a row and column. Now you have an array, which means you have n different directions 
and you want to find vectors that span those n directions. Okay. Not just one direction, although they're pretty good. And all those boy band members all have done very well. Like that Neil Horan, he's he's everywhere these days. Anyway. There we go. We're going to go n directions. So let's do it. So let's take this picture and I'm going to draw you one level up. This is a, a matrix. Let's go to one higher dimension. In other words, I have a data cube. Let's call this my tensor M. This is a calligraphy M. You can tell how well I did that with my, my pen. I did a calligraphy M here. So this is my tensor now. Notice how I've arranged the data. It's in, I don't just have row columns. I have just different directions here. In, and this is, again, when you collect data generically with different uh, measurements, oftentimes you can get data that is multi-dimensional. If I were to collect data, of course, spatially, like in latitude, longitude, elevation, that's already a 3D cube, but I could imagine saying, oh, I collected all that, plus I also collected three different variables at each lat long la ele latitude elevation, which means I'd have three dimensions and three dimensions in each one of these cubes, right? So it's a higher dimensional object. And I don't really care how many directions it has. Now, when you do the SVD, normally when we do these matrix decomposition, you just take all this and flatten it into a vector and then just do your analysis. But what I want to do is say, what is the equivalent of this? Because I want to do this, but I don't want to flatten it. I would really like to keep those relationships together. Things that are close in the way I collected this data will remain close when I do the correlations. So this is a, a higher order SVD. So this is a tensor. Okay, so this object here is a tensor. Okay, Had, or a multi-dimensional array. And a two-dimensional array is a matrix. A one-dimensional array is a vector. Okay, so matrices and vectors are subsets in some sense of tensors. All right. So what I want to do here is do exactly what I did there. So I'm going to draw a picture of this to get the concept. And the concept is the following. I don't just have rows and you know columns and rows. I have now these three different directions. And so what I really want to do is there is this direction of the data. I want a vector that spans that. There's this direction of the data. I want a vector that spans that. And then there's this direction of the data. And I want a vector that spans that. And what I'd like to do is construct these vectors in very much what we did the way we did the SVD by correlations, dominant correlations. Okay, so it's going to kind of look something like this. Sigma one, and now what I'm going to get is an outer product of three vectors. So this is the most dominant direction. So this vector is supposed to be representing just like U1 did, the column space represents the this space, this vector here represents along this direction, and this one here represents, sorry, along, sorry, along this direction, this one here is this direction. Okay, so I've got all three represented there, right? So this one here, this one, uh, I'm getting myself confused. This one, this one, and this one, there's just three dimensions. There we go. That's the first dominant direction. Notice it's three vectors. So it's not just a U and a V. It's like a, a U1, a U2, and a U3. So now you have these three orthonormal directions. When I did this, I have the U. I ultimately have here, when I collect everything, I have this U and a V, right? And these are two orthonormal bases. But when I go to here, I have three orthonormal bases. One that spans this direction, this direction, and this direction. That's kind of the concept of what you want to do is just say, oh, why well, work with two? If I'm an n-dimensional array and here it's three-dimensional, I need three ortho orthonormal directions. If I have four-dimensional array, I need four. This is the maximum visualization possibility I can draw though, right? On a two-dimensional board, 
I can only draw you an array of three. Okay. Plus sigma two, again, next direction. Plus sigma three, outer products. Plus, same. So you see, I'm using the same concept here as here. I'm doing a decomposition so as to find these different directions that are, in fact, maximally informative, much like the SVD, because the SVD itself, right, is, in fact, uh, provides a way. We got these from looking at the correlation matrix, and that's exactly kind of what this is doing as well, which is how do I do something similar to the SVD, which is to find the directions of maximum variance in each of these three directions that I have represented in this cube. Okay, and when I find those directions of maximal variance, in other words, the dominant eigenvector of a correlation matrix or correlation tensor N, I put those down here. And that's how I do low rank reconstructions with this thing. Now, here's the interesting thing. There are multiple ways to define this process. Unlike here, there's uh, one unique way. So when you do an SVD, you'll find there's one unique way to do it. When you do tensor decompositions, people have come up with a variety of ways to do them. And part of what we're gonna talk about in what we do is gonna be sort of factor analysis or um, what's the other one called? Uh, uh, we're gonna use some standard definitions sort of a, that is more the higher, uh, the standard definitions of what a tensor decomposition does. Uh, but we're not, gonna, we're not gonna do it today. We're actually gonna do it next time. Questions on this? So I, I think this is kind of where actually I wanna go and actually uh, this actually, uh, ended up shorter than uh, I thought it would be, but I want to write down just a couple more comments around here before we finish and then I'll take questions. All right, so, so first of all, what does it mean then to represent this in terms of a rank decomposition of that tensor? So let's come back, because remember, we know how to do that with the SVD. In fact, just before I did this, I told you how to write down a sum which represented the low rank decomposition of a, of a matrix. And now we want to do the same thing here, which is what we're really going to do is if we have this decomposition, and notice just like before, it's a linear superposition. So what I want to do is to say to represent this tensor M, it's going to be equal to sum over, you know, say j equals one to r. And one way to think about doing this then is just say, well, I have the sigma j. And what I do now, let's call each direction, let's say, let's say this direction here is the a of j, b of j, c of j then what this is, is an outer product between the dom, and what I'm representing here, the A of J are these guys here. So let's call this A, A of J's. So actually this is A1, right? And this, uh, okay. And then uh, here I have B1, C1, and I have, a2, B2, C2, A3, B3, C3. And so what I do is say, I'm going to take this outer product. And the way I represent this then is to say this thing here, sigma J, which is the weighting of each. And then you have A of J, outer product with B of J, outer product with C of J. So this here, is the representation of my approximation to the data matrix through a low rank, rank R, uh, tensor decomposition. And notice what happens here. I never 
flattened the data. I kept the data in its original form so that I didn't break it apart into giant vectors where now something that are close spatially gets separated by a long ways just because I vectorized it. Here, everything that's close in that data cube stays close in, these, in this calculation. And so that's one of the advantages of something like this is that often the thought around tensors is that, hey, you actually get some advantage here because what you're actually doing is when you do this here, you can actually keep things localized instead of, vet, instead of having this issue with the vectorization, moving your data long ways apart from each other when they're actually supposed to be very close to each other. Okay, more broadly, if I think about that SVD, if I think about an SVD, remember the SVD says U1, U2, U3, those are the, those are the dominant directions, but we call that a matrix U, right? In other words, the matrix U collected all the dominant vectors, it was a, a um, a unitary matrix, right? They collected all those matrix, all those directions. And so I could do something similar here and represent this instead of as a sum like this with all individual directions. I can think about this as representing this as, let's call it A of R, B of R, C of R. So what these are, are the collection of all the A of J's, B of J's, and C of J's. So this is like U sigma V, okay? So that's what that kind of means here. Of course, we got to still figure out where that, you still have this guy coming in here. So we are missing the diagonal matrix, but this is kind of the idea of like, this is the equivalent of U sigma V, where remember, if one way to write this is if I combine these two together, let's call it U, uh, um, B. In other words, just take these, multiply them together. Then it's, this becomes essentially like an outer product. And that's exactly what we're doing here. Have each direction. We can write them like this. Okay. And so, and the R represents my truncation. How many modes did I do to truncate this? Okay, um, that's where we're going to end here. What we're going to do next time in class is we're going to produce some data and we're actually going to go ahead and do some tensor decompositions. And then, uh, so we're going to not vectorize our data. We're going to just play around with it, do a tensor decomposition, and then also compare it to if we were to vectorize the data and do an SVD and then from after the vectorize and we do the SVD, we come back and reshape it back to its original form. We're just gonna compare how well does this do versus how well does keeping it in a tensor form work. And there's a package called NArray that um, you can download on MATLAB. And I'm not exactly sure if there's one equivalent for Python, but I'm sure there is somewhere that you can find, look up tensor, tensor uh, decomposition software uh, for Python or MATLAB, and you can find stuff there that will do these decompositions for you. It's interesting, it's not built into MATLAB, or at least it wasn't uh, as, of, as of a year or two ago. Like you had to actually go download people's codes that were up on MathWorks Central. Uh, so, so it's interesting, and part of the reason for this is because there are different definitions of how to do that tensor decomposition versus one clearly established way and so then because of that, I think that's why you don't have a built-in package to MATLAB. But you know, the nice thing about MATLAB is stuff evolves. They, they kind of modify and update MATLAB pretty often, every half year, right? That's why, well, that's why you have you know, MATLAB 2020A and then 2020B and then 2021A and 2021B. Okay, stop there and ask, and you guys